So, let us consider now a very special case of a second order differential equation, right? Linear differential equation, linear constant coefficient second order differential equation. So, let us say it is y double dot plus a y dot plus b y is equal to 0. I am sure you all know how to solve this. In case you have forgotten, it is straightforward to check that one of the ways you have learnt in ODE courses is to consider the complementary solution. So, this dot of course, as by now you would know, it is DDT differentiation with respect to time. So, you take d squared plus a d plus b, where d is some variable and treat it like some you know algebraic variable and solve that equation and find out the roots of that polynomial, which in this case is quadratic and then say the roots are m 1 and m 2. So, the solutions will be c 1 some c 1 constant times e to the m 1 t plus c 2 times e to the m 2 t. Very loosely speaking, this is something you must, must have done in your plus 2 level itself, right. But here we are going to look at it in a slightly different fashion. So, let of course, uh, you will also need y 0 is equal to y naught and y dot 0 is equal to y dot naught, just some constants. Of course, you cannot solve a differential equation unless you are given initial conditions, otherwise it is just some arbitrary numbers, a specific solution corresponding to a specific initial condition, right. So, let y is equal to x 1, y dot is equal to x 2 right and then what do we land up with in this case for instance what is x1 dot is x2 and what is x2 dot x2 dot is y double dot y double dot that is equal to minus a y dot minus b y but in terms of x 1 and x 2 what is this? This is equal to minus a x 2 minus b x 1 right. Now, think about it if I want to write this in the following manner I hope you will not object is equal to 0 1 minus b minus a x 1 x 2 is the same system right you agree with of course x 1 0 uh, x 2 0 given by y 0 and y dot 0. Actually let me not use the dot notation for constants it is bothering me a bit. So, let us call this uh, p and q. Yeah. So, this is p and this is q. So, far so good. So, instead of trying to solve this differential equation, I might as well turn my attention to this. There is no difference you agree. One of the things that happens in writing a differential equation like this is you had a second order differential equation. Now, you have reduced it to two first order differential equations, but of course, life does not get any easier. Why? Primary reason is because after all these are still coupled. See the different the, the solution of a differential equation that is a first order is very simple. We know exactly what it looks like. So, for instance, if you have x dot sorry x dot plus a x is equal to 0 with some x naught is equal to what should I call it alpha right. Then what is this? You remember what this is? This is e to the minus a t yeah that is what your x is, let me write it here, x t is equal to alpha 
e to the minus at. You agree? Can we solve this? I mean, you can solve it straight away. Like, if you if that bothers you, then just write dx dt is equal to minus a x. Therefore, dx upon x is equal to minus a dt, right? Which in turn would lead to the natural logarithm of x is equal to minus a t plus some constant, is it not? I see is the arbitrary constant of integration. But now if you just open it up, you will get exactly something like this, except that instead of alpha there will be a c here. So if you plug in the initial condition now, that a t is equal to 0, so this means that, so this means that we can write x is equal to e to the minus a t times e to the c, right? But then at t is equal to 0, what is it? x 0 is equal to alpha is equal to e to the c, right? So in other words, I can just say that this is equal to nothing but alpha e to the minus a t. Why, why am I writing it like this? Because just to show you that why this is appealing, this is very easy. So we might be tempted to wish for a system of equations where we could have purely reduce, reduced this to purely two first order differential equations that do not depend on each other. And life would be so simple, right? Because whether I write it like this or I had the original differential equation written, ultimately it's just a different representation maybe, but in so far as the solution goes, it doesn't seem to ease my job. On the other hand, if there was just x1 dot dependent on x1 alone, y1, x2 dot dependent on x2 alone, which would give this a structure of what exactly? A diagonal matrix. So if I had a diagonal matrix sitting over there, things would have been a lot easier for me. So the question then arises, this is of course just one form. It's not the only form in which you will see second order differential equations. In general, this is what you will see. So in general, we will have x1 dot x2 dot is equal to a11, a12, a21, a22, x1, x2 with x1, 0, x2, 0 is equal to alpha, beta. In general, we will have this to solve for. Of course, that A matrix that I have just written out over there is a special kind of a matrix. It, it has a special uh, structure, by the way. This has deep system theoretic implications. We will not get there. Okay? This is one choice of what we call state variables of the system. But anyway, let us not get there. So in general, for a second order differential equation, if you constant coefficient second order differential equation like so, if you want to write it up in the most general form, this is what you are likely to face. So no bonus for you, that is these two terms that are the cross coupling terms. See this term couples the dynamics of x1 with x2. If this were not there, the x1 dynamics would have been purely evolving according to the value of x1 at that instant and it is a first order differential equation. Yeah. Similarly, in this second case, the a21 is playing foul. If this a21 had somehow managed to vanish, then what would I have had? x2 would have been a purely decoupled equation. I could have solved it like a first order differential equation. Now, unfortunately, none of these is true in the general case. Okay. So, how do we go about this then? Or what would have been a desirable thing? So, think, think about yourself like you are trying to solve this problem and make it appear like this and you are trying to come up with some conditions, some necessary and possible necessary and sufficient conditions so that given any such system like this, 
I can always substitute this because after all substitutions are all we do. Substitute one variable for the other. So any such substitution that might exist so that I will eventually be able to get this matrix to look like a diagonal matrix. And thereafter I can just use this simple tool that I just showed, this, this kind of a solution. Solve each of them individually in a decoupled fashion and be done with it. So that is the motivation. It's, it's at least uh, you will agree that it is a uh, sensible motivation to have. right? Because it considerably simplifies the solution of this differential equation. So, and in fact if this does not serve as enough motiva motivation, just think about an nth order differential equation where you will have an n cross n matrix here. Of course here because two dimensions are easy to show so I am taking this but in general our question will extend to n dimensions. right? So can we or can we not do this and if we can then what is it that will allow us to do it? That is the fundamental question. right? So suppose this is the first thing we are doing. Of course there is nothing to assume here. Suppose V1, V2 is a basis for R2, okay, such that, I mean up until this point it is quite straightforward, yeah. So I am going to call this matrix as A, right. So suppose V1 and V2 forms a basis of R2, but not just any arbitrary basis such that <coughs> A V1 is equal to lambda V1 and or rather lambda 1 V1 and A V2 is equal to lambda 2 v2 well lambda 1 and lambda 2 <coughs> let's say in this case the field is real so these are just real numbers suppose somehow someone has told us that this is given <coughs> right now subject to this can you do that decoupling business I hope this part I can erase now, right? <clears throat> this part is clear, okay. Let me say let <clears throat> x of t, what is this a two tuple <coughs> is equal to say x tilde t times x tilde 1 times v1 plus x tilde 2 times v2. In other words, this is the same as writing in the language of basis yeah, that x t, so let us call this the basis please ask if this is not clear. all right agreeable so we say that this is an ordered basis now yeah and in terms of the ordered basis i can of course write this as coordinates right so then x dot i'm going to drop this t sub argument it's understood that it's a variable it's a variable that depends on t 
because I am of course differentiating with respect to time. So, x dot, but the v 1 and v 2 are constants, right, because they are just a basis set for r, r 2, why should they change with time in this case. So, this is x 1 till a dot t v 1 plus x 2 till a dot t v 2. Agreed? Yeah? Would you agree with me if I write this as v 1 v 2 like so. So, this is a matrix now 2 by 2 matrix times x 1 tilde x 2 tilde right dot of course. Thank you. Yeah. So, now what do I have here? Let us call this matrix V. Yeah. In fact, we can very well write the same thing here x is equal to V x tilde. I mean I could have also drawn the same conclusion here that x is equal to v x tilde. So, now what does this mean? What is this also equal to from the other hand on the other hand this is equal to a x, but a is a 2 by 2 matrix. What is this x? v x tilde. So, this is also equal to a v x tilde yeah no problem so far clear. So, what do we have then? We have v x tilde dot is equal to a v x tilde as an analogous representation of the same equation is it not? Of course, the initial condition would be different. What about the initial condition? If you have this as x 0, you can just check that the initial condition will change somewhat. Hmm? But as far as the dynamical equation is concerned, this is the same thing, right? What can I further say about this? Is this v invertible? It's not. Is this matrix V invertible or not? Yes. It's a full column rank, of course, because V1 and V2 are two columns and they are linearly independent because they form a basis. So it's invertible. So why not just invert it? I mean, I want to get a representation similar to the x dot is equal to ax in terms of the x tilde dot is equal to something times x tilde. Hmm. So I can write this as x tilde dot is equal to v inverse a v x tilde. Does that ring a bell? Isn't that the representation of an operator subject to a change of basis? So, you have changed the variable in terms of a new basis and now you have the operator in terms of the new basis. See, it is the same connection, no? In terms of the old basis, A was acting on it. In terms of the new basis, V inverse A V acts on it. No difference whatsoever. But is there something interesting about the character of this? I wonder. Look at this. If I now write this as V inverse A V1, V2, X tilde, which in turn will be V inverse A, V1, A, V2 times X tilde, right? Agreed? What is this by my premise? What is it? Lambda 1 v 1, lambda 2 v 2. So, let me carve out a little bit of space here. That means, 
x tilde dot is equal to v inverse and bear with me a while times lambda 1 lambda 2 0 0. Do you agree? Because this is lambda 1 v 1, this is lambda 2 v 2. So, I am just pulling it out as a diagonal matrix here. What is this? We are back to v again. So, v inverse times v because this fellow is nothing but v. Yeah. So, if this fellow is nothing but v, then v inverse v is identity. So, what I have is let me call this big lambda x tilde. And now in terms of this changed basis, what I have is a completely decoupled system. So that means this has seen me through. Yeah. Right. At the end of the day, it is this that has seen me through. Now, if I extend this for sizes greater than 2. Do you see any problems in so far as the operations that we have carried out here? Which is to say if it is a 10th order differential equation or a 50th order differential equation and of course then you will have the assumption that a v 1 is equal to lambda 1 v 1 till a v 50 is equal to lambda 50 v 50. Nothing. Everything carries forward in exactly the same fashion only the size of the problem increases. So, you would have then ended up with a lambda which is a diagonal 50 cross 50 matrix. What I am saying is this generalizes. I am just showing it for 2 by 2 because it is easy to uh, see it at first glance. But this process that if this assumption holds instead of R2 to Rn with V1, V2 till Vn being a basis for Rn such that Avi is equal to lambda Ivi for I going through 1 to n you would have still ended up with the same picture, a system of decoupled equations, each of them being first order. Now imagine the benefit this has. A 50th order differential equation entails solving for a 50th order polynomial and its roots. Yeah, the complementary solution. For a general polynomial, unless it has a very special structure beyond the fourth order, you will not be able to find any closed form solution. You will have to resort to numerical methods. On the other hand, if you can make this work, of course, I am not saying this is any easier. Do not go with the misconception that, oh, this simplifies the solution of polynomials. No, it still does not address that main problem. It just says that provided these are somehow possible to obtain, yeah, then you will be able to do this. What is so special about this kind of a formulation? When a square matrix acts on a vector, what does it do to that vector? The vector, of course, takes linear combinations of the columns of the matrix. But what does the matrix do to the vector? Yeah? Scales it and? What do you mean by scales? Now that you have the idea of scaling, you should be able to tell me what is scaling? What do you mean by scaling? How do you quantify that magnitude now? No. Great. Fantastic. So we understand. So what you can do is you can sort of get an operator which is what a square matrix is to act on a vector to elongate it or shorten it. When I say elongate or shorten, it means the norm either increases or decreases. What else? It can also rotate it. So, in 2D, it is easy to visualize those rotations and elongations. Of course, in 3D also you can visualize, but beyond 3D, you will just have to let your imagination run wild. But the point is, these are the things that can do. However, when you look at this particular vector here, there is something very special going on. You see, it is only a scaling that is happening. So, these are irrotational, rotation invariant directions as if, right? Because when you get this A to act on a vector such that it results in lambda V or scale times that V, it is still going to be in the span of that same vector, right? It does not leave that span of that vector. So, it is invariant. That span of that vector is A invariant. Yeah, in the language that we have spoken about, of course, we have not yet gone into the depths of what is A invariant and all that, but when A acts on that vector, it is still invariant. Hmm? So, these are very special vectors in that sense. Okay? 
uh, we will not launch into formal definition maybe in today's lecture, but we will carry on with this whatever we have insights we have gleaned about the solution of a second order differential equation through this sort of a substitution and we will see another sort of an application, not really application, but how we can better represent the solutions of differential equations. Okay. So, up until this point we might have felt that solution of a differential equation means some algebraic expression, but there is also sketching of the solution of a differential equation and that is as good as any solution that one might conjure, right. Which is to say that, now suppose you want to qualify the kind of solutions that exist, right. So, starting from an initial condition, does the response of the system decay? Does the response of the system blow up? If it decays along which direction does it decay? How does it decay? How does it blow up? Those are interesting questions, right. So, of course, algebraically if you write down the solution, you might be able to do a bit of analysis, but geometrically it turns out we can probably do even better. So, for that we will deal with the new basis in terms of the x tildes, the transformed basis and see what we get. So, remember we have two of these numbers lambda 1 and lambda 2 to play around with, right. So, now let us call this the x 1 tilde axis and this the x 2 tilde axis, right. So, you already seen that x dot is equal sorry x tilde dot is equal to a x tilde. So, in some sense you can figure that if this is the position coordinates of a of an object in two dimensional space, then this is the velocity. Hmm? If x x 1 and x 2 are just coordinates in the two dimensional space of an object then this is just the velocity, the way that position is supposed to alter with time, evolve with time, yeah that is given by this velocity. So, this is called the field, not the field that we have learnt in algebra by the way right at the beginning, it is a vector field, okay. <laughs> Even though it contains vector and field, it has got nothing to do with the vector space notion and the field notion, okay. It is a vector field of the dynamical system, the way in which it evolves. So, do not confuse those notions, right, okay. So, now of course, and some x tilde 0 given by some I do not know alpha tilde and beta tilde, right. Okay. Now, suppose lambda 1 is negative and lambda 2 is also negative, right. And suppose you start from a point here. So, let me use different colors. Now. So, you start from a point here. How do you think you are going to evolve with time? Now, if, okay, let me just write this as the lambda, right, because it has already changed now. We know it is diagonal. So, when it is diagonal, it is ready made, the solution is available. What is it? It is just two first order differential equations of the form. The first fellow is alpha tilde e to the lambda 1 till t, the second fellow is beta tilde e to the lambda 2 t, yeah and lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both negative which means that those exponentials are decaying exponentials. So, as t increases, you are starting from here means x 2 tilde is 0. So, x 2 tilde is 0 means this beta tilde is 0. So, how are you going to evolve? Is there any going to be any change to x 2 tilde? No, right? Because x2 tilde dot is just lambda 2 x2 tilde and x2 tilde is 0 at every instance. So, it has no velocity. So, no velocity component along the x2 directions whatsoever. No change along the x2 direction. The only change is along x1 direction, but where? To the left or to the right? To the left because it is a decaying exponential. So, x1 must decrease with time. So, starting from here, you will as t tends to infinity asymptotically approach this. And what is this direction by the way? Is this not the Eigen vector corresponding to or the principal vector corresponding to lambda 1 for this matrix? It is a diagonal matrix, 
We have not defined Eigen vector yet, so let me withhold that term for the time being. Okay. So this, if you have lambda one and lambda two, and if you want to write this as, say, x no, no not x maybe z one z two is equal to lambda one z one z two. If you want to solve for this, what do you think is z one and z two going to turn out to be? One zero which is just this direction. So this is actually one of those primary directions corresponding to this matrix, not the original matrix, but this matrix, right? So you're going to evolve along this direction. What if you had started from here? Again, the story is the same in so far as x2 tilde is concerned, right? But what about x1 tilde now? Which way, right or left and why? Why? Because again, that fellow lambda 1 is negative, which means the magnitude of that must decrease. So if you're going to the left, then the magnitude, of course, it's more negative, but the magnitude is increasing and that cannot happen. As t increases, the magnitude must decrease, whether it's positive quantity or negative quantity, the absolute value must decrease. So this, starting from any point here, similarly, this is how you will evolve. Let's take something along this and along this. What do you think would happen? I put it to you that you will be moving along this and this direction. Is it not? Yes. Same argument because both of them are negative after all. So no change in the argument, no? But now the interesting case. I mean, points on these principal axes, uh, it's very straightforward that way too. Suppose you take an arbitrary point here. How are you going to evolve? Where are you going to go? First of all, you have to eventually end up at zero because both those exponentials are decaying. But there are so many different ways. No, you can go like this. I don't know. Maybe not this because this is just crisscrosses. There's a nice result which says that such ODEs will have unique solutions so you cannot have the, the, the solution crisscrossing on, onto itself, right? Again, something we are not deriving, but again, I ask you to believe me on that. But nonetheless, you understand that it's a meaningful question to ask, right? Like how will this trajectory evolve, starting from a point like this? If it's too difficult, just think of this like the x and y coordinates of an object, of a point mass, whose dynamics is given by this. Hmm then you will immediately be able to see this is the path traced out by it, right? Now, starting from here, how do you think we should go? Now we need a little more information to, not to put too fine a point on it, but we also need the information about, see both of these are smaller, um, smaller than zero. But now we'll have to say that which one is more negative? Suppose, I'm going to draw for this case, maybe leave the other to you as an exercise to figure out and it's going to be, you can probably even guess right away once I've drawn for this condition. So suppose this is the case. Then what will happen? What do you think? How and why? So at this point, your motion along the x1 tilde direction is governed by what? Yeah, by lambda 1. That rate is governed by lambda 1, right? And your motion along this direction is governed by lambda 2. Which one is decaying faster? Lambda 2, because it's more negative, it's decaying faster. So how will you approach this? More decay in the x2 direction because if this is a higher thing then by the parallelogram law this is how you should head and then you know piecewise you can string together when ultimately you reach very close to this you still have quite some way to go here right is this argument clear with that being the case you can now easily infer starting from here you would be approaching like so Maybe starting from here, you would be approaching like so, starting from here. 
you would be approaching like so. Same things hold here, just check that from different, different initial conditions, you will be approaching like this and by the same token, starting from here and here, this is what we call a phase portrait, okay? And this is as good as the solution of a differential equation, if you can sketch this, all right? Now, going back to the more fundamental and important question. So, of course, try out the case where lambda 1 is less than lambda 2 is less than 0. That I leave to you as an exercise. So, this is what I have drawn here and this is what I am leaving to you as an exercise. I mean, you can probably just write away guess. Don't give me the answer, <laughs> even if you can. Let some of your friends try, right? So this is the solution, okay? Next, we are not done yet because this is some artificial variables that we have created to ease our understanding. But if I now want to sketch this same thing in the original, state space of x1 and x2, how would it look? Yes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, or you can say that you can make this stick like this, you get it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's the same story. So 90 degrees is very special and thank you for pointing that out because that's exactly what we are going to now talk about. You see here, if you look at this matrix lambda, and you look at its corresponding v1 and v2, they are actually orthogonal. So what you have in this special case is a basis that is not just obviously linearly independent, but also an orthogonal basis. You had an original A, in which case you looked for this v1 and v2. Those v1 and v2 was just a basis, regular basis, no, no uh, like nothing imposed on them. But now you've gone to this diagonal form and now if you look for those similar kind of vectors in this diagonal form that satisfy lambda v is equal to like big lambda v is equal to small lambda 1 v 1 or big lambda v 1 is equal to small lambda 1 v 1 big lambda v 2 is equal to small lambda v 2 they turn out to be just e 1 the first principal basis yeah and the second one so 1 0 0 1 and they are orthogonal so when you've gotten a matrix down to its diagonal form, these vectors that you're going to generate by satisfying that condition which I've just erased here are going to be orthogonal and which makes our sketch so easy. But now I'm putting it to you. Suppose I, okay, let me use the white color. <clears throat> let me use the white color. The same thing now, I want to go back to my original state variables because see, if you for example take this x1 and x2 to be two voltages and currents and this v1 and v2 is just some abstract uh, vectors that I have chosen which might not have any physical significance. Maybe you are taking the combination of a voltage plus a current which has no physical significance, it is not even physical variable. You might have plotted all of this but I am not too happy because I am not seeing the connection between a voltage and a current. This is some voltage plus some alpha times some current, this is some uh, voltage plus some rubbish, some gamma times some current. Yeah, it's a mathematical solution, true. But from an engineering perspective, it has no physical significance. Hmm? So I want to actually see how in terms of actual physical variables, which are probably x1 and x2, not x1 tilde and x2 tilde, how these objects would evolve. So what is the idea? How would we expand our imagination in that case? Yeah, that's an important question. Recall we still had those two vectors in this domain. Maybe I should call them v1 tilde and v2 tilde here. So that in the original domain here, where I had x dot is equal to ax and a v1 is equal to lambda 1 v1, a v2 is equal to lambda 2 v2. So remember this v1 and v2 were still there, very much sitting inside. Yeah? Suppose this is the span of V1, right? 
and now v1 and v2 have no obligation to be orthogonal they can be just any two vectors that are not in the same span and they will be linearly independent because it's 2d after all the only way they can be dependent is if one of them is zero or if one of them lies in the span of the other so any two non overlapping fellows so this is v1 the span thereof and this is v2 the span thereof now in this i want to be able to draw a figure similar to this and then i would say yeah, yeah i have a solution in terms i can solve for the current and voltage individually of course algebraically you can back substitute and solve it also but i want a geometric picture we're not going doing any algebra here we're just sketching based on our geometric understanding and here the understanding is as follows what is it every point that you pick out here has an image where remember that substitution what did we say x written in terms of the basis where b is v1 v2 is what that is exactly x1 tilde and x2 tilde is it not remember just maybe flip through the pages and you'll see this what does this mean whenever you're choosing any point in the first quadrant of the x1 tilde x2 tilde space that means these two fellows are positive so you're taking x1 tilde times v1 which is a positive extension along this direction plus x2 tilde times v2 which is a positive along this so it must be a point in this cone within this cone somewhere so a point here gets mapped to a point here so these points here get mapped to points here similarly these points here you can readily verify now what is it x2 tilde is positive x1 tilde is negative so x2 tilde is positive that means this is still on this side and x1 tilde is negative so this is on this side right so where, where what are we talking about sorry what is this this is where x2 tilde is positive right so x2 tilde is positive means we are still dealing with the resultant of a vector along this direction and a vector along this direction okay so i have probably flipped the order somewhere so anyway so that's going to be a point somewhere the resultant of those two will be somewhere over here yeah so i have just flipped the order so don't mind but you see you can always work it out that's the point i'm making right so you see even though this does not split up the space into four cones that are right angled cones which is very nice here but this still splits up the whole space into region 1 region 2 region 3 and region 4 where this is region 1 this is region 2 this is region 3 and this is region 4 yeah unless i have messed up i think that's how the order is right yeah that's x2 positive x1 negative x1 tilde negative so x1 tilde negative means it's v1 folded back yeah i think that's what it is right so now what do you think is it going to be the main part the trajectories how are they going to be plotted the argument is still the same because if you are going along this at a point here which vector is it going to approach fast and towards which vector is it going to approach slower yeah because remember this is the condition we are checking this this is what i have left as exercise for you so this is the condition i am checking then the decay along v2 is very fast so for any point here what are the directions of the velocities this is my direction the direction parallel to this is going at a rate e to the lambda 1t and a direction parallel to this it is going at a rate e to the lambda 2t agreed agreed now if that is the case then which one is greater e to the 
lambda 2 t that component is much greater no. So, this is going to be much greater. So, the resultant is going to be like this. So, eventually you are going to kill off which component faster? Which one are you going to approach as time proceeds? It is exactly the same argument again right. So, the component the, the decay along lambda 2 is fast. So, eventually you are going to approach as t tends to infinity you are going to approach along this are you not sorry I should almost merge it here like this yeah. Yeah. So, here if you start for instance you are going to march merge along this for instance here like this yeah if you start from here again you are going to merge along this and like so like so if you start from here again yeah it is just v 1 is it not? Yeah. So, I am do something like this right. Do you see some pattern here? See this one if you, if you just imagine some sort of a figure it is just a distorted version it is just squeezed in but the fundamental character remains the same right. This is just orthogonal so equally stretched out and this co four cones are all right angled cones here. But here two of those cones are really acute cones and two of those are really obtuse cones. The obtuse cone gets really stretched but eventually you end up from any point eventually converging onto the axis which is sort of the principal axis that is along this direction. So, it is a distortion right. So, we will not dwell on this for too long in the next lecture we shall just quickly wrap up with this for different cases which is when both of them are positive. I will not give the such detailed explanation. So, make sure that you understand this and when one is positive and one is negative by the way this is called a stable node ok. When one of them is negative and one of them is positive it is called a saddle point and when both of them are positive it is called an unstable node. So, those are the three kinds of uh, pictures or phase portraits that you will obtain when the lambdas are real. So, the next lecture we will quickly cover that part and then move into other interesting topics on eigenvalues and eigenvectors starting with the definition of those terms. This is just some sort of an application of how this notion carries forward for dynamical systems. Thank you.